Welcome to this Authors in Conversation panel featuring the 2023 Minnesota Book Award finalist in the competitive general nonfiction category. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. This year's book awards are sponsored by Education Minnesota and the general nonfiction category through the generosity of the Duchess Harris Collection. My name is James Densley. I am a professor of criminology and criminal justice at Metro State University. And I was the co-author of The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic, which was the winner of the 2022 Minnesota Book Award in this category. So I know all about how exciting it is to be nominated for this award and to be part of this meet the finalist process. As we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of this land on which most of us in this panel recording are participating from today. This land was reserved for the Dakota in the Treaty of the Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and the Ojibwe people are the original stewards of story in this place that we now call Minnesota. The Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, organizers of the Minnesota Book Awards, honor this tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we all work together to lift up storytellers in our state. For this latest installment of the Minnesota Book Awards popular Meet the Finalist series, I'm delighted to be joined by Carolyn Chalmers, author of They Don't Want Her Here, Fighting Sexual and Racial Harassment in the American University, published by the University of Iowa Press. Maya Washington, author of Through the Banks of the Red Cedar, My Father and the Team That Changed the Game, published by Little A, which is part of Amazon Publishing. And last but certainly not least, Teresa Wilhelm Wildorf, author of Wilhelm's Way, an inspiring story of the Iowa chemist who saved the Manhattan Project, published by Third Generation Publishing. Congratulations to each of you for this Minnesota Book Award finalist nod. As I mentioned, I've been in your shoes and I know just how exciting it is. In fact, I have my Minnesota Book Award uh, uh, here and uh, it sits proudly on my desk at work as a reminder every day of what has been a pretty incredible year uh, as, as a winner. So congratulations again. And in the interests of making this uh, a fruitful time together here, I wanna begin with a round robin question that I'd like each of you to respond to in turn. And then I'll have a question or two, maybe, specific to each of your wonderful work. Okay, Carolyn, I know this is a book about a case you handled when you were young as a lawyer, but what inspired you to write this book? Um, <clears throat> I saw that the University of Iowa was um, forgetting about the lessons they should have learned from the case. And I didn't like that. And I, and I thought it was very important that they not forget about what they had learned. Uh, and I thought that I had some responsibility for um, reminding them about this experience from my point of view. Um, and uh, so I wanted to, I wanted to shine a light on, on that. And I'm I'm grateful you did because it's a, it's such a compelling story and it's so timely. I would like to ask Maya, what inspired you to write this book? Can you talk a little bit about the origin story of this work and how long it was in development? The origin story is uh, a long one. 
2011, my dad's teammate, Bubba Smith, passed away. Uh, they played together at Michigan State University and uh, were in a historic draft class in 1967, were uh, among four African-Americans drafted in the first round from the same university in the 1967 draft to go in the first round uh, in the top eight picks, like a historical thing that had never happened before hasn't happened since. And it was at Bubba Smith's memorial that I started to hear stories about their time uh, in college and better understood that there was this amazing uh, integration story that happened at Michigan State University, but that was very much part of the fabric of my own family's life. And so that 2011 spark led me to a documentary film project called Through the Banks of the Red Cedar. And from 2012 to 2018, I worked diligently on that project and released it to the festival circuit in 2018. It debuted on the Big Ten Network in 2020 and now has its home at PBS. And uh, the book sort of followed that natural progression of telling my father's story in a very... Um, personal way. It was very much a, a father-daughter journey. And so the opportunity to write the book uh, also came around 2018 when um, Little A acquired a, a book proposal that led to uh, the book that we have now. So uh, all in all, it has been nearly 10 years of me uh, researching, investigating, and finding different containers to hold my dad and his teammates and their contributions uh, to American history, but also kind of where I fit in all of that. And I, I've got to ask you, converting from a film project to a book project, was that always by design or did it sort of organically just kind of grow out of the work? And was it difficult to make that pivot? It, it def yeah, definitely difficult. Um, the the thing that's, I guess, unique about me or my process as a creative and as a writer is I kind of allow a story to tell me what container it wants to be in. And so initially when I stumbled upon this history, a documentary made sense and it, and it was a way in that allowed me to interview my dad and teammates and have otherwise intimate conversations that were supported by having a camera in someone's face. Um, and, and so that camera kind of melts away, but a lot of that um, investigation ended up leading to the book. And so with other film projects that I've done in the past, there has been a literary component to it. There has been a component of arts education or community engagement. So I had been so focused on the film that it seemed like a great idea for a book to come forward, but it wasn't necessarily part of the original vision. And when it emerged, it was uh, extremely satisfying, but difficult because I had uh, lived with this film project uh, that had been completed for approximately two years prior to my uh, turning in the final pages of the manuscript and uh, finding my way into, okay, so I've already told the documentary version of this. What is What does this look like on the page? Um, how does how does this extend and contract? And so I think those were some of the difficult questions I had to answer, but also uh, an opportunity that was really fun in in that challenge and in, in figuring out how you move from uh, what I'm again calling a container from from one container or or genre or medium to another. Now, Teresa, your book is also a family story. Uh, quite similar in that sense to, to Myers. So I'm wondering if you could also just uh, answer that same question. What was the origin of this particular work? Uh, what inspired you to write it? And, and what was that process like, taking all this information and translating it into the book that we, we now have in front of us? Well, in 1986, when Wilhelm Hall was named at Iowa State University, I was told by my parents, you need to come to this event. I'm like, well, my grandfather, we called him Grandpappy. They're naming a building after him. And I was so surprised. And I arrived there and the news media were there and the governor and the university president, all these important people. And I'm 
there's more to this man of a grandfather than I know. And there were some things said during that event that stuck with me. I was in my 20s and they stuck with me, but it took decades before I moved on it. Over, during those decades, I kept hearing stories from my father and his siblings about that the history, there's a hole in the history. And it's a, the chemistry of the project got forgotten. And when you read about the Manhattan Project, you hear about the physicists and all the work that the physicists conducted, which was very important. But the project would not have succeeded if not for the imperative work of the chemists. And so I was hearing these stories about your grandfather did this. He purified the uranium, but I didn't really know what that meant. And then I started uh, reading up on the Manhattan Project and realized that in these stories about the Manhattan Project, you would hear a line would be say, yeah, there was a problem of uranium and they solved it, but they never said how they solved it or who solved it. So Wilhelm and his whole team never got the recognition, at least in the general um, historians' views of, of the Manhattan Project that they really deserved. Well, then I... Um, you know, I realized this is really, it's a missing link in history, and it's not just my family history, but it's Iowa's history, and it's United States history, and it's world history, and the things that came from the Manhattan Project changed the world that we're in today. I mean, we've got nuclear energy, we've got nuclear medicine, even Rover on Mars, all ties back to what Wilhelm did on the project. So those were very inspirational to me as I started realizing that, well, at, as I started to work on the project, and I was interviewing family members, I I came to realize that my grandfather's personal story was incredibly inspiring. And he overcame many uh, obstacles from his youth to be able to end up on the world stage in chemistry. And uh, there were pivotal moment, moments that happened and they you couldn't help but be inspired. And I talked to people about, about him and they go, that needs to be a book. Okay, it needs to be a book. So I started started doing interviews, and I, I initially started interviewing my father and his siblings. My grandfather passed away in 1990, so he wasn't around for me to be able to interview him. But I heard these family stories, and um, I'm like, well, these are really great stories. How can I wrap those into a story and also tell chemistry and also tell history all in one book and keep people wanting to keep reading? And um, I just ended up doing more research and, and finding, uncovering things. I, I did these family interviews, but then I interviewed colleagues of his who were at that point all in their 90s. He would be 120 if he were still alive today, but he um, uh, had colleagues or people who were former students that were in their 90s that I was able to interview. And I did research um, in Drake, at Drake University, at Ames Laboratory, at Iowa State University. I flew to Washington, D.C., there were a lot of different places I went to find information about Wilhelm and the work that they did. On top of that, I got the unbelievable um, opportunity to speak to one living person that was actually purifying uranium for him in the 1940s. He had been a supervisor and his name was Jack Boyd. And he added a lot of color to the story because he was there and for the explosions and the fires and and the things that were happening on the project and the personalities of the people that were involved. So I was able to pull those elements to make the story much more um, colorful. And, um, I, and then I did online research. When I first started the project, and my project took really, I started 15 years doing a little bit of digging, but then in 2015 is when I really dug in and uh, dedicated the work effort that needed to, to culminate in a book. And there weren't really much in the way, there wasn't really much in the way of online archives yet. And they started to come online about a year later. And I was able to, to discover archives from schools that he taught at and newspapers from the 1900, early 1900s that had stories about his, his um, athletic pursuits I, that just, you know, astounded me when I was actually seeing that these stories that I had heard all my life were actually in documented in the newspapers. And so there were a lot of different sources of things that I pulled into um, creating the story. And that's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> so. Well, I, I want to follow up on that because I want to ask of all the digging that you did, 
What was the most surprising thing that you learned about your grandfather that perhaps you you weren't familiar with from the stories of your youth? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, talking with people who worked with him, I, I knew him as my grandpa and I, of course, loved him, but he was beloved by the people whom he worked with and who reported to him and revered. I mean, he was just my grandpappy. And here he was held in such high esteem and revered. And it just just put him in a whole new light um, for me as looking at who this man was in as a whole. Um, his humility and his humanity really came through in the stories and, and the way that people talked about him. A couple of other things were that, you know, this Pythagorean theorem. I mean, I had heard that and I never believed it that he had come up with original proofs for the Pythagorean theorem, which is over 2000 years old. And I was sitting in, I was sitting in the archives in Drake university. And I was going through a file that had his uh, records in it. And lo and behold, there was a photocopy of a newspaper article from 1923 that stated Wilhelm spent the summer between his junior and senior year coming up with more than two dozen original proofs for the Pythagorean theorem that he then presented to the math department. I about fell off my chair in the library. I couldn't believe it was true. It was true. And then just, like I said, the athletic pursuits, um, this other story that I didn't really know much about and hadn't heard much about it, but about the children's teeth in Ankeny, Iowa, that were being mottled which is when they turn brown and he was the he was asked to be on a research project and he figured out what was causing all the children in Iowa's teeth to darken and it was actually a national problem but it was worse in Ankeny Iowa than anywhere else in the U.S. and he solved solved it. Wow that's that's really cool. Um, Maya I want to ask you a similar question question because this is obviously a book about your father's life were there things that you learned in the course of the research here that really floored you took you by surprise that you never knew um and and what was it like sort of learning about this person that you've grown up with but you're now looking at them through a different lens well I think it's still a, uh, it's still quite astounding, right? That I have both of my parents alive and with me, um, uh, and they grew up in a completely segregated environment. That the world that I was born into that was integrated, and uh, even though obviously I have faced discrimination and had experiences of racialized um, discrimination the experience of the world that they grew up in, that uh, segregation, that deliberate um, disconnection from their full potential as American citizens um, has been something I've always been uh, aware of, conscious of, a, a story that they've always shared with us and, and given us a sense of how important it is um, to achieve our goals, uh, how important education is, how much, uh, how important literacy is, sort of all of the benefits of, of that hardship were sewn into myself and my siblings and uh, those in our community uh, growing up, but to actually take the time uh, to spend in rural Texas where they grew up to spend time in uh, archives and in historical places and spaces and really understand the political and historical context for what was happening in their community, what was happening in America, what was happening you know, a few states over in Mississippi uh, and how my father's trajectory, he was part of a historic, uh, I would say recruitment experiment that Michigan State University started recruiting players uh, in the South because of segregation. It was kind of a leg up that they had over Southern schools who uh, did not permit my dad and others to attend those public universities because they're African-American. And so uh, Duffy Doherty, the head coach at Michigan State, went into the South, recruited those uh, athletes. My father got his recommendation from Bubba Smith, his teammate. And uh, that 
always astounds me. That teammate lived about 100 miles away in a town called Beaumont. My dad uh, was raised in Laporte. So now we see how competitive uh, college football is, and, and, and it's rare that a family would go out of their way to make sure that while a school is looking at their child, they go uh, consider uh, recruiting another kid from an opposing uh opposing school. So um, my dad having that opportunity, but the history around the institution and the president of the institution at that time, uh, excuse me, John Hanna, who was actually the chairperson uh, for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. So his role was reporting to, you know, the White House on civil rights violations and, and humanities issues in the, in the country while leading a university that my dad happened to be attending um, from 1963 to 1967. So I think every sort of um, historical and political uh, information that I could glean from all of these different places and applying that to my parents just subjective lived experience of coming of age and just trying to uh, achieve a life outside of a segregated system. My, my mom went off to uh, Northern California to a junior college and was in the Berkeley scene uh, at the time. Uh, my dad was at Michigan State in the, in the Midwest. And so they were having experiences that had otherwise not been available to them or other people um, from their community and uh, understanding the resilience that that took um, is just a different kind of appreciation that I have from my parents and people of their generation who have lived through uh, really awful, <laughs> awful times um, and live to tell about it and use their lives to contribute to access for other people. And um, that all sort of being in, investigated as I'm finishing um, the manuscript in Minneapolis in 2020 and 2021 and seeing um, the unrest that they experienced in 1967 moving to Minneapolis um, unfolding in Minneapolis in real time and um, some of the challenges that uh, we're facing in, in real time. So I think uh, the cyclical nature of history is really surprising right now and, and really lands. Um, but I think every detail and, and, and tidbit as I place my parents in historical context and, and what their experience of, of starting their family and my dad's football career, everything that occurred um, in the, the 60s and 70s, um, I was not here. <laughs> so um, I, I have two older sisters who, who were part of my parents' early life um, as a married couple. Uh, but, but all of this is something I'm learning about from a completely different lens uh, because I didn't live it. I wasn't there. And so um, just knowing how incredibly resilient my parents are and how dignified and respectable and respectful mm -hmm they have been and continue to be, um, despite every um, challenge they face has just been uh, inspiring, um, humbling, and sometimes extremely overwhelming, uh, given the, the, the climate that we've lived in the past few years in the Twin Cities. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, is when you were writing the book, did you did you go into the project because it was a family project and it was connected to your own history to some degree with an understanding of the arc of the story? And or did you find that that changed because of what was going on in society around us at that time? Because you're right, those lessons around racism and discrimination and and segregation in society, they feel timeless and they actually feel to be honest almost more important and powerful today reading them now in that context i'm wondering if that sort of weighed on you when you were when you were writing this book did it shape the trajectory of the book i think that's a great question um i think of course in some ways it 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 had an influence it it came into uh the experience i think when i look at 
um, and I haven't looked at it in years, but if I were to look at the book proposal to what the final, you know, um, book became, um, again, the outline initially was, was taking a very similar approach to the film, which really, uh, was weaving the, the past and the present, which was kind of consistent between, uh, both, but the book allowed me to go, uh, deeper into understanding the historical context for all the things that happened at Michigan State and in the country and in the Midwest as it pertained to uh, Black football players before my dad. Um, but also if you're gonna look at um, the participation of Black players from uh, you know, the turn of the 20th century to my dad arriving in 1963, um, <laughs> you can't not, <laughs> you know, look at at all of these other historical uh, events and things that were happening in the South and 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 um, everything from scholarships and and what the Big Ten Conference thought of uh, resources being given to student athletes at that time versus how we think of it now. So um, I think the wormholes that I could have gone even further down, you know, like to, to really uh, investigate all of these different things that I personally find fascinating to, to uh, look at um, the extent to which those who come before you set you up and that you suddenly become a person who's coming before someone else and, and how that influences um, history and the historical record. So I think uh, being in, in the Twin Cities during the uprising and the key thing that was really uh, eerie, I don't know that it shaped my um, manuscript differently, but um, around the time that the unrest was unfolding in 2020, I was you know reading the uh, Kerner Commission findings uh, in 1968. And those, um, those, concerns about, you know, uh, America being warned of two separate uh, Americas, one black and one white, and that if the United States did not take immediate action on a set of issues, we would be in a very serious situation. Uh, a few years prior, um, John Hanna at Michigan State in, in his role on the U.S. Commission uh, for Civil Rights, uh, they had a publication in 1963 um, that uh, also made suggestions about what the country could do or should do as it pertained to um, civil rights in America. And so the same themes that were there in the in the 60s were there in 2020: um, relationships with police and policing, access to housing, jobs, and healthcare. Uh, unfair portrayals uh, in media and the media's role in access to a variety of voices. Um, and recognizing that <laughs> these were issues that were um, important, that the US government found important in 1963 and also found them important enough in 1968 to um, you know, commission different studies and investigations to be in 2020 and see that those concerns are still with us. And so um, I, I think I really did my best to stay on the road of my parents' journey and um, uh, what it means to me and where I am now and where we are now as a country. But, um, you know, I can't not... <laughs> I can't not have some of that, what was happening in 2020 and 2021 come in, uh, come into the room, come into the conversations I'm having, you know, in the in the fact check process and in uh, conversations with um, my editorial uh, team at, at Little A, um, because for me uh, to witness my parents live through that and for me to be called in different ways to my community um, in service and in response to uh, the challenges that uh, we face. Because depending on who you are, where you were um, during that time, uh, it was a really hard time to be in the Twin Cities and especially difficult um, if you identify with a marginalized identity. 
and, and understood um, that, that, that real physical pressure that we faced and that our communities faced during a global pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you mention the, the Kerner Commission uh, in 68. I'm a criminology professor and we um, often teach about the long, hot summer of 67, the uprisings in Detroit in particular, obviously Michigan State, not far from there, um, and, uh, and how history has a tendency to repeat itself. And so um, uh, it was great to hear that answer. Um, Teresa, uh, I want to come back to uh, Wilhelm's Way. This is a story of sort of daring do, if you will, um, at a, you know, in, in many ways, in, in our darkest hours. Um, do you think there's also lessons here that are relevant when we think about the, the world that we live in here today? I do. I think that um, the world was in crisis um, at the time, and I think we're in crisis now. If you look back at the effort that went into taking down the enemy, right? We came together as a world to go against evil. And the Manhattan Project, I think when today's younger generations don't understand the context of the times and that we were fighting against an enemy who was working on the project. They were working on um, their own project and we didn't know what would happen if they were the ones to succeed first in that project. But coming together as a country, I mean, it was all hands on deck, not only for the Manhattan Project, but for the full war effort and, and the citizenry. People had their own um, gardens, their victory gardens, growing their own vegetables. People were um, saving metal and doing all kinds of things to help the, even I believe uh, like drip, bacon drippings and things like that, they were saving all for the war effort. We came together to go against evil. And I, I worry that there's not an understanding of what evil really looks like by everybody and, and being able to perceive what's really going on um, in the world. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question really, but you know, the Manhattan Project was a race against time and against an, an enemy we didn't know if they were going to beat us or not. And, and when the bomb was used, as horrific as that is, and there were, you know, 100,000 or more people who died, if we had invaded Japan, the losses would have been way larger. So um, millions, probably, both on the Axis and the Allies side, combined and and by ending the war quickly and swiftly we essentially um saved the japanese culture because those those if we'd invaded japan their their whole culture would have been wiped out because the u.s would have it devastated the, the, the entire island and so the lesson is in we have to look at history in context because we're not living in a time where um, likely atomic bombs are not going to be used. I mean, there's the fear of that, but one of the things I say in my book is, you know, the greatest deterrent to them being used is the fact that they were used and the devastation was seen to the world. What can happen with that? It's a no-win situation if we end up in an atomic war. I think this is important because it sounds as well like something you probably have wrestled with over the years, which is that there is so much kind of hope and positivity um, in this book, but at the same time, the conclusion to the book is always that we had a nuclear bomb. Right. And so it, there's not really like a happy ending in the sense of the traditional sense of the word, right? Right. But I think what was quite compelling about the book is that because this is an individual story, you still come away from it with that sort of happy ending, if that makes sense. And I, and I imagine that was very intentional on your part, is managing yes. 
the, the, the weight of history with we're seeing this through the perspective of this one sort of one man's heroic actions. And it's a very inspirational story for that reason, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. You know, he he had a teenage boy who, if the war continued on, his own son would be out fighting probably. And the neighbor boy died during the Battle, battle of the Bulge. This is very personal. People wanted the war to end. And um, this ended the war. And in doing so, um, saved millions of lives. And and yet, you know, a lot of people died using the bomb. <laughs> so it, it was a struggle. And, and it, at first, I didn't have anything about that in the book and I I wasn't sure I wanted to go there but I ultimately from feedback I had beta readers and I had my editor and they say you need to address this so when I started doing research I'm like you know we did firebombing in Japan that in one night killed as many people as were killed by the bomb war kills people it kills massive amounts of people. It doesn't matter what the weapon is. And so the war just needed to end, but I wanted to, and so I tried to put some of that in, into the story to put some context around, you know, using the bomb as horrific as it was, people were dying anyway from the war and we needed the war to end. I think what's interesting though is um, we have, four books up for this award but there is this sort of um, parity if you will where two of these books are very much connected to family history but also these very sort of inspirational personal stories of struggle yes and of sacrifice and then of you know success and of triumph uh, through that adversity as well, which is um, what makes the conversation like this very interesting, because you can sort of see how these books are talking to one another uh, as much as we are talking to one another mm -hmm. uh, now as well, which is something that I, I felt uh, we wanted to, wanted to tap into here today. Um, I wanted to just uh, ask a sort of a, a follow-up to this, which is, when you have readers read your work, which is the best thing that anyone can do, right? Is the best thing that anyone can do is to read your work. Uh, that's the biggest compliment they can pay you. What is it that you are hoping that they take away from it? What's that one big takeaway that you hope comes from the end of this? And, and Teresa, I want to ask you that first. Well, for me, um the historical record right this is a missing hole and in the record and in the physicist story was out there but the chemists weren't and i i feel like that was a hole that needed to be filled and i've done that and um it's interesting i was in church yesterday on easter sunday and somebody in the congregation tracked me down and she came up to me and she says teresa I have to tell you, I got your book from the library and I read your book and I couldn't put it down. And I'm like, well, why? And she goes, because you did such a great job of weaving the history and the science and the story together. And that's what I want to hear is that that's what I want to really want to have take the takeaway is like they, they get the story, they get the context, they're inspired by Wilhelm's life and the obstacles he overcame. And this little boy from Southern Iowa changed world history. Anybody can change world history. And I just love that. Maya, what would you like readers to take away from the book when they're finished? What would you hope is the lasting legacy of that experience? I hope that after reading, you know, Through the Banks of the Red Cedar, um, people are moved to consider that history is in their own household. Um, for me, I just kind of grew up with a dad who went to work and wore a suit and, you know, worked in corporate America and, and that um, 
He was opening doors for others, uh, connecting people with opportunity and taking the time to actually learn more about how and why that happened and why he and my mom had been so committed to helping others uh, gain access to their um, goals and their dreams and their potential was because of, of their own history and probably the history in their households and, and, and on and on and on. And so um, I hope that uh, people are moved to, especially um, African-Americans in our country and, and other groups who haven't had the benefit of our stories being um, shared from a holistic standpoint in our academic settings, in our K through 12 education and um, college settings outside of, um, you know, the specificity of black studies or literature or, or history. Um, that oftentimes when we see ourselves in historical context, it's other people writing our, our narratives or writing about us from a distance and from a lens that that doesn't uh, belong to us or, or live within us, I guess I should say. And so um, I hope that people really are moved to understand, especially uh, for people in this country in the United States uh, who are part of the fabric of American history that hasn't been recognized or acknowledged that uh, for every major um, activist whose name we know or historical figure or political figure um, whose name we know and recognize, there were everyday people who as a part of, of how they used whatever gifts they had, whatever uh, intellect and access they had to make their life better and make life better for other people, there's usually an amazing American history story in that. Someone was the first to do something uh, in pretty much everyone's family. And if they weren't the first, they were a beneficiary of something that shifted or changed that allowed um, something in particular to unfold um, in a house in a household. And uh, sometimes that was a tragic set of events or circumstances. Sometimes that was um, a great fortune and opportunity or, or, or luck that, that, that came in. Um, but I genuinely believe everyone has something in their own personal experience um, that's historic and uh, in their community. And um, it's worth documenting and it's worth um, finding a way to celebrate. I think specifically for my dad and uh, his teammates at Michigan State University, as well as uh, in the NFL at, at the Minnesota Vikings, but also the league in general, my dad is part of a cohort of black men who were extremely significant in their time and place uh, that they happened to become uh, college and professional athletes and were part of changing the face of, of college football as we know it and even professional sports. So I think anyone who considers themselves a, a football fan or a fan of history um, should know about the basic shifts that occurred in race and sports in America and should have a, a, a working knowledge of how uh, arts, entertainment, media, and sports impact society and vice versa um, to really sink your teeth into to history and appreciate um, the football game you're watching on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday uh, or any other sport uh, for that matter, including uh, women's participation in sport. So I think those are my, <laughs> those are my primary primary takeaways I, I hope that I've left with the reader well I know I'm feeling very inspired uh having had this conversation uh I want to thank all of the authors for your incredible work I want to wish you all the very best of luck uh in the uh the, the finalist process and uh, it's really been a great honor to, uh, to have this dialogue with you today. So thank you for that opportunity. And I hope our viewers are enjoying this just as much as I am. So again, congratulations on being finalists for the Minnesota Book Award. And thanks so much for this conversation. Thank you. Carolyn, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, I know this has been a difficult time for you. You're still on your personal recovery journey. 
overcoming leukemia just a few months ago. We're just so delighted that you are with us here today uh, and so grateful uh, for this opportunity to have this conversation. I'd like to start our dialogue with you um, and the book, They Don't Want Her Here. Um, when you set out to write this book, how did you get started? First of all, I didn't intend to write a book. It was a surprise to me that it came out like that. And secondly, um, I got started by auditing some cl classes in uh, creative nonfiction here at the University of Minnesota and sitting in with um, students who uh, shared the projects they were working on and who um, had insights into um, their work. And I found that just really helpful and fun, just fun for me, you know. So who, who do you hope will, will read this book? I hope that young people considering the law as a career will read the book, for sure. And what lessons do you hope that those young people you know, trying to follow your footsteps into a career in the law will take away from this book? I think that I hope that they'll see what a big responsibility it is to be a lawyer and to advise a client and that they'll be um, impressed with the perseverance that's required and with the... Um, Maybe the dedication that you, you've shown to this type of work. Yeah. What do you feel the book tells the reader about social change, change over time? I think the book is not um, overly rose-tinted tinted about social change. And it kind of tells the story of how hard it is and how much time it takes. Um, but recognizing that it's not a rosy picture, I think that it still, um, it's hopeful. I, I When I first started working on this project, I talked with some of the people who had been supporters of genes. And one of them said, please make it a hopeful book. You know, she said, I don't think there's very much hopeful about what she went through. And I thought that was quite observant of her. And I held to that as a goal for myself. I think you absolutely achieved it in my read of the book. Your relationship with Jean is central to the mm -hmm. book. Can you talk to me a little bit about that relationship? Hmm. It was very enduring, of course, and very positive. Uh, we trusted each other uh, and we trusted each other for weeks and weeks and through very difficult circumstances. Uh, and that, that was a strength of our relationship. And it's one reason we got through to the end, basically um, without terrible injury. <laughs> <laughs> so this book is about your story but it's also about Jean's story That's right um what was involved in writing someone else's story 
I think that um, respect um, for the fact that it was her story and uh, permission, her permission to write it again and to um, unearth the um, problems that had been let, left to lie in Iowa City for a long time. So to begin with, I needed her permission and she gave it quite willingly. At least I think she gave it willingly. <clears throat> most rewarding part of writing this book and doing this work? It was very rewarding to go back through the files and to see all of the work that went into this case. I mean, we had, we had, um, We had boxes and boxes of files. And so it was rewarding to go back through it and, and to see it all. Um, and then it was just very re rewarding to um, take the uh, experience with Jean and revisit it because we had been through such a cauldron together. Um, what would you say then, is the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, and then um, uh, we hadn't seen each other for a while after it was done. Um, and so it, it really was um, very rewarding to get back in touch. And they have it be, um, and to update our relationship and to have a project like this to work on. Thank you to our tremendous general nonfiction category finalists and to all of you watching for taking part in this Meet the Finalists panel. If you enjoyed the talk, you can find a treasure trove of past events archived on the YouTube channel of the Minnesota Book Awards Steward Organization, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. You can also find more about future programs on their website, thefriends.org. In particular, mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 2nd. That's the evening where our winner in this category and eight others will finally be revealed. Join us in St. Paul at the Ordway Center for Performing Arts. Tickets are only $22. And you can visit thefriends.org forward slash MNBA for details. So until then, thank you to the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library for all you do. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.